afternoon. On behalf of the Community Design Center Board of Directors and our staff, I'd like to welcome you to the 15th annual Reshaping Rochester Lecture Series. For those that don't know me, my name is Maria Fergiuelli and I am the Executive Director of the Community Design Center of Rochester. This year's theme is building community through placemaking. And as much as we were so looking forward to gathering together for our annual Reshaping Rochester Lecture Series Luncheon, celebrating this wonderful series that featured women in design, we are very pleased that we were able to offer this presentation virtually today. The theme for this year was building community through placemaking. And through this lens, we consider how the way we shape our built environment can have a positive impact on our community. The Community Design Center of Rochester was founded in 2003 and is celebrating more than 15 years of service to the greater Rochester region. We promote design excellence and sustainability in the built environment through advocacy, education, and grassroots community facilitation. An important part of our educational mission is what brings us here together today. I'd like to introduce our board members. Our board president, Bill Price, and our executive team is on the top row, Monica McCullough, Stephanie Annunziata, Vanessa Villeneuve, and our former president, Paul Tankel. Natalie Anderson, Eugenio Marlin, Sheila Sloan, Howard Decker, and Tanya Zweilin round out our team. Thank you so much for your commitment, guidance, and support. We would like to recognize and thank New York State Council of the Arts, who has made our work possible through the generous support for many, many years. And to CMB for being a long-term uh, sponsor and supporting the work of the Community Design Center. Our circle of friends members are persons or businesses that have made a commitment of a sustained support to our organization. We gratefully acknowledge their support and we extend an invitation to any of you who value the work of the Design Center to join our circle of friends. A special thank you to our presenting sponsor, Home Leasing. We are truly grateful for Home Leasing's commitment to the series and their generous support of our work. I'd like to acknowledge our other major sponsors, ESL Charitable Foundation and the Community Preservation Corporation for their support of the series. Our event sponsor for this presentation is Bergman Associates. These are our supporting sponsors for the series. And these are our lunch and supporting sponsors. Gifts, are general, gifts generously provided by these sponsors will be sent to our speaker. And I'd like to acknowledge Gleason for being our evening lecture venue. WXXI is our exclusive media sponsor. And special thanks to AI Rochester for being our continuing education sponsor. As you can see, we have many organizations, businesses, and individuals that support our work. We are grateful to each of you for your support. I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize the unsung heroes that have made this series possible, in particular, our CDCR staff, especially Monica Reifenstein for being our Zoom wizard behind the scenes, our lecture planning committee that works tirelessly year round to develop the program and the series, and of course, our board of directors. Your feedback is very important to us. Please help us improve our programming by responding to our survey. If you include your contact information, you will be entered to win a Morning Glory gift card This presentation has been approved for professional development credits for architects, planners, and landscape architects. The next several slides relate to those in the audience who are earning CES credits. To receive CES credits, please send Monica your name, affiliation, certificate request, and email. She will also provide um, through the chat a, uh, a contact information for you to do so. This is our course description. 
And these are our learning object objectives for today's presentation. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Kimberly Baptiste. Kimberly is a planner and a government practice leader at Bergman Associates. Welcome, Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, and good afternoon to everyone listening in. I hope everyone is healthy and finding ways to cope with this unsettling times that we're finding us, ourselves in. I know a great outlet for myself is finding ways to be inspired, and I think as we hear from Tony Griffin this afternoon, we will all have the opportunity to be inspired. With an unparalleled resume that includes an appointment to the U.S. Commission of Fine Arts by President Barack Obama, leadership positions at community-based organizations in some of the nation's largest cities, a professor at Harvard University School of Design, and the director of Just City Lab, Tony Griffin is an international leader and practitioner who helps communities craft and implement bold approaches in the realm of urban design and urban justice. Tony has devoted her career to working with marginalized communities that have experienced long histories of spatial, social injustice, as well as disinvestment, doing so long before these topics made national headlines. Her work is always focused on creating just cities by empowering communities through inclusive and collaborative practices that are rooted in addressing social and economic disparities. Please join me in welcoming Tony Griffin, whose work, and I quote, is rooted in change, change that is happening, change that is needed, or change that is being presented, prevented. For all those listening in, prepare to be inspired. Thank you, um, Maria and Kimberly. Um, the board of the Rochester Design Center, uh, sponsors, uh, board, and a special hello to Howard Decker, who is an old colleague of mine from Chicago. Uh, and good afternoon, audience. Um, these are certainly challenged times. Uh, I think this is my very first sort of formal lecture to a public audience. Uh, so with that in mind, um, forgive me if I stumble and look down, um, but I'd like to start um, with a story, if you don't mind, uh, given that context. Uh, in Chicago, my cousin wakes up at five each morning and prepares to head to a local elementary school just a few miles from her home on the south side of Chicago. She's what we used to call back in my day the lunchroom lady. She's head of a lunchroom staff that prepares and serves meals in a Chicago cafeteria school. Over the course of the day, she is either the cook, the server, the supervisor, the disruptor of unruly youth, or the auntie who just gives you that extra helping of chicken fingers with a wink and a smile and says, there you go, baby. And despite Chicago's shelter in place mandate that is now going on its third month, but starting to reopen, at the height of the quarantine, my cousin's daily routine did not change pre-COVID to post-COVID. Each morning when she wakes up at 5 a.m. Central Time, she sends a morning prayer out to all of my cousins. We're all on a shared cousin text, as I imagine many of you are with friends and family around the country. These texts sometimes also include a video clip of her and her colleagues um, staying motivated by singing, doing soul train lines in the hallways, or exploding in laughter, all while cloaked in different variations of formal and makeshift PPE gear. One Saturday morning, she shared on a text that the Chicago schools had served over 6 million meals in the time of COVID through only 250 public schools that were still open and feeding students. She also commented on her exhaustion. She was complaining of a toothache that day and the dwindling endurance of staff who had quit under the pressures of those work conditions. Undoubtedly, these are tough times for individuals and households and tough choices to make, prioritizing their health over a source of income or vice versa. While it would seem that my cousin had prioritized her income, I also believe that she had prioritized the children who depend on their school for 2.5 meals a day. 
My cousin is a force to be working with. She is strong in both personality and will, lovable, strict, and caring. Her coins are tight, but she ties each week to her church and would give you her last dollar if it lifted you up. My cousin is a warrior. My cousin, like most Americans, lives paycheck to paycheck, thus relying on making steady, long-term employment essential to her survival. Over these last three months, people like my cousin have been elevated to the status of essential, to the infrastructure of us all surviving COVID-19. Under normal conditions, her role and even her black body might be typically overlooked, underestimated, or undervalued. You can imagine that most rambunctious school-aged kids, and even sometimes their newly educated young educators, walk past these workers every day without acknowledgement or recognition. They are just the bodies that keep the building operational so that the primary function of educating can run seamlessly. But now, those desperately needed workers, the black and brown bodies that feed our children, transport us from place to place, harvest, package, and bag our, and deliver our food, and keep our cable and internets intact are part of the essential ecosystem that is saving our lives. The COVID-19 crisis relies on these bodies to support our everyday needs and the first line responders in health and public safety. These are the bodies who travel the furthest to work because they can't afford to live in the center city. These are the workers who spend more than 40% of their incomes on rent. And these are the bodies that often live in neighborhoods with the lowest health and educational outcomes. COVID-19 has made economic injustice visible for those who normally ignore income disparity. And now the video of George Floyd's death has made racial injustice even more visible. And the reality of how these same essential workers bear the disproportionate brunt of violence by those designated to protect and serve. So why justice and why now? We've been taught to recite with liberty and justice for all, but I think it's safe to say not everyone has the same liberties and justice has not come to all. It's time for justice because historical and current power imbalances within institutions that are not representative of the people they serve yet make decisions on their behalf. It's time for justice now because the intolerance of difference is a devaluation of humanity. It's time for justice now because growing income disparity hurts us all. It's time for justice now because without knowing the history of intentional racism built into the policies that designed our cities, we will never effectively create the livable, sustainable cities of our desire. And it's time for justice because ignorance drives fear, fear drives hate, hate drives violence, a violence we are being forced to witness daily and with minimal repercussion. So who is justice for? I skipped a page, I'm going back. <laughs> We've been taught to recite with liberty and justice for all, but I think it's safe to say not everyone has the same liberties and justice has not yet come to all. All lives matter is not the same as black lives matter. This country is built on multiculturalism, yet there are those who believe some do not belong. Justice is not just a black and white issue. Health protections for women are at risk. And for the LGBTQ community. A fear of faith. And it's not just our bodies that are under attack. Our natural, natural ecosystem and the measures that protect the environment also need protection. The segregating, gating, and walling off of neighborhoods and cities is on the rise. What would we do 
about access to weapons of harm. The registering of who belongs in public space and who doesn't and who decides. Who gets to narrate and make visible our history and who doesn't? What histories are visible and which ones are not? Those who stand up or sit down for ch the change they want to see. And those who kneel to make visible the visible. For many who we seek justice for, their injustice is situated in the spaces of the city. A series of conditions instigated by public policy, advanced by private capital, deepened by generational poverty and disinvestment, and stigmatized by the erosion of care for our neighbors has created conditions of injustice. The story of decline begins for most American cities at the middle of the last century, initiated by federal housing and transportation policies that made it easy for businesses and families to flee crowded cities and aging inner city spaces. This abandonment led to further disinvestment and blight. Several of these images that I'm showing you are from Detroit a decade ago. This abandonment has led and rendered many cities' public infrastructure systems inefficient due to the reduced tax revenues and fees that would normally fund maintenance, upgrading, and renewal. Issues of racial segregation, originally put in place by law, became more spatially pronounced and st still very present in today's geography despite the notion that most people believe we live, in a, we live in a time of more integration. However, in reality, studies show that over 80% of the white population would have to move in order to live in more integrated communities, and an only slightly higher percentage for Blacks. Startling demographic data about poverty, education, and employment, as seen here in these maps of Washington, D.C., are another marker of the segregated city, segregated around employment, class, and education. The darker the shade of gray, the lower the attainment for each of these categories. The injustice of segregation furthers both social and spatial isolation, reinforced by the redevelopment efforts that deploy tactics of defensible space and entrenchment contributing to an architecture of fear. Eyes on the street, Jane Jacobs moniker, was abandoned and replaced with fortified round floors, elevated sidewalks, and gated doors. If I had given this talk last month when Maria and her team um, wished that we were all in the same space, um, I believe that for many people, Justice would be a rather abstract term, different from today when it's being made more visible on our television screens. A more common and comfortable nomenclature for addressing the issues that I just described would have been equity. I believe that equity, while a necessary aspiration, is too neutral and therefore not sufficient in describing the pain, hurt and malice that must be understood to heal and correct the acts of injustice. Therefore, we must be clear about the kind of justice that is necessary. I offer five definitions for consideration. The first one is distributive justice, which is about fairness in what people receive from goods to attention to services. If people do not think that they're getting a fair share of something, they will first seek to gain what they believe they deserve. Procedural justice. If people believe that a process is fair in deciding what it is to be distributed, then they may well accept an imbalance in what they receive in comparison to others, making process just as important as outcomes. Restorative justice 
In this case, the first thing that a betrayed person or institution or community may seek from the betrayer is some form of restitution, putting things back the way they are. I offer an amendment to this form of justice because returning to the way things were, a previous condition may not be a suitable alternative for some. As such, a form of reparative justice may be a better term to use and a better aspiration to seek, which may be more about correcting the wrong before restoration can occur. Retributive justice is a type of restoration where the betrayed may not feel like restoration is enough and may seek some sort of revenge, begging the question, must there be punishment for being wronged in the first place? I would hope that this is not the form of justice that we would practice. And lastly, interactional justice. This is a concept that has been new to me in the last few years, which is about the quality of interpersonal reactions and relationships in a particular situation. Attributes of interactional fairness include truthfulness, respect, propriety, and justification, which are essential pretexts for making the other forms of justice effective. Our relationships with others, who we have relationships with, the bandwidth of those relationships are essential to achieving justice. Today, I address the conditions of injustice and the pursuit of justice through design. But 10 years ago, I grew skeptical of design's ability to alter the trends of social and spatial injustice. At the same time, I was becoming more knowledgeable about design's contributions to injustice. At that point, I launched my firm, Urban American City, and I also began teaching and developing a research agenda aimed at investigating design's role and impact, fully prepared to expose both our collective successes as well as our collective failures. I'll start my summary of some of this work with the Just City Lab, which is my research platform at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, where I'm a professor of practice in urban planning. After years of course curriculum and crowdsourcing the question, can design have a positive impact on social and spatial justice? The lab has formulated this point of view about the just city. A just city is where all people and communities, but especially the least not included, have access to the networks and environments that offer the opportunities and resources to be productive and prosperous, advancing their social and economic mobility and agency. We investigate and document the role of design through written and video narratives, designed projects, convenings, and engagement. We strongly believe there is no single definition or set of metrics to determine if a city is just. The Just City Index is a language of 50 values intended to be used by cities, communities, organizations, institutions to self-select and define what makes for a more just city in response to the unique social, economic, political, and cultural conditions of place. We use the index as a tool of engagement when access when accessing a common language to talk about conditions of injustice or difficult conversations to confront like racism is needed. We use this tool, and we've used this tool in convenings in South Africa, Rotterdam and Amsterdam, and domestically for conversations ranging from black futurism, black sense design, aging in place and designing justice. We use manifesto posters and we document the findings from those posters, both the conditions of injustice found in different settings, as well as the values important to each place or context or organization to both aggregate and compare visions of justice aggregated by either city, age, race, or gender. I also explore issues of justice in the courses I teach, both seminars and design studios. The first studio I'll describe is called Urban Disobedience, 99 Provocations for Disrupting Injustice in St. Louis, 
which was a studio we conducted three years after the death of Michael Brown and a year after the Ferguson Commission Report on Racial Equity was published by stakeholders and community leaders in St. Louis. The studio documents 99 distinct conditions of injustice in the city using secondary research, interviews, focus groups, and site visits, ranging from issues of demographic disparity, housing inequality, xenophobia, the public realm, and power and balance. After our week-long site visit, where we toured the city, met with stakeholders, the visit validated our research findings Students then used the Just City Index to draft distinct manifestos that embodied key Just City values to shape their aspirations for a just St. Louis. The students then each created 99 distinct design interventions for justice that respond to each of the conditions of injustice they documented earlier. Three examples are provided here. Under the category of disrupting the places where we live, two students proposed ideas um, for interventions related to housing and neighborhood redevelopment in the areas of um, previous redlined districts established by the federal and local government in the 60s and 70s. This group of interventions addressing disrupting xenophobia, looks at two interventions, one which suggests that um, pastors and reverends from different parts of St. Louis, which is a city divided north-south uh, by race, black and white, um, do an exchange of their reverends and pastors and priests to different parts of the city as a way of building cultural uh, awareness around religion, and another intervention which looks at um, who surveils public space and providing transparency through an art installation on knowing who is surveilling you, when, and why. And a third category of interventions out of the 13 that we developed was called Disrupting Spaces That Segregate. This is a particular intervention that looks at the border between St. Louis and adjacent counties, where it was found that a high percentage of police officers stopped African Americans and issued tickets in order to collect fees for the adjacent county. Similar to the St. Louis studio, um, we use a similar methodology for our second studio based in Pittsburgh called Pattern Justice, Design Languages for Just Pittsburgh. Similar to St. Louis, we investigated patterns of injustice that showed up in four Pittsburgh neighborhoods representing four neighborhood trends, stable, emerging, transitional, and disinvested. In this studio, we collected 50 patterns of injustice, including issues related to lost retail, disengagement, capital leakage, and the invasion of big box, as well as issues that included neglected side yards, school vacancy, and issues of being priced out of housing. And our design interventions here responded to each injustice, similar to as we did in St. Louis, with distinct actions that were meant to be scalable and replicable and also designed to um, have an uh, impact on specific populations of the city in which the patterns could be mixed and combined and used in different parts of the city across neighborhoods. Here you see a few examples that address the issue of big box retail, another um, business development initiative that addresses capital leakage, an innovative program for looking at the decommissioning and redevelopment of public schools, always reserving use for always reserving a use for community in addition to private uh, investment. A similar project that looks at surveillance, and another project that looks to recreate um, and activate vacant space through creating ghost space. 
I'll now close by sharing a few examples of my practice, Urban AC. We are practiced with the ability to embed ourselves as partners with our clients in designing, leading, and managing complex, comprehensive, and tr transformative social and spatial urban planning and development strategies rooted in addressing historic and current disparities that involve police and class. Our practice is rooted in the principles of just urbanism, which we have defined as a disruptive framework of policies and practices that produce outcomes designed to break down historic structures and systems of oppression, inequality, and access. Our approach that we take to projects begins with gathering stories through data that help us establish truth and build relationships and build towards a collaborative client group that includes multiple sectors, where we integrate technical and community expertise to establish a shared vision, combined with defining just city values for place and context that allow us to create innovation and develop just and equitable strategies that are actionable and measurable. I'll share two examples of work I've done in the recent um, few years that begin to put some of my policy and practice uh, and philosophy uh, into practice. The first one is Detroit Future City. Detroit Future City was a three-year effort to create a framework plan for addressing chronic injustice that contributed to population loss and economic decline over 60 years. The importance of taking a comprehensive citywide long-term view of this work was essential. Untangling 60 plus years of decline takes more than a few months to reverse if the goal is to create new systems of justice for the long term. This work was deeply rooted in um, trying to figure out what to do with the massive amounts of vacancy, over 100,000 vacant parcels, over 80,000 um, vacant homes and structures, and a population loss of over 60% since its peak in the 1950s. There are seven key lessons I'd just like to highlight for you coming out of that work and now reflecting on it some five years later. First, it was very important for us to recognize that there were different quality of life needs needed for different neighborhoods. We made very clear that every neighborhood requires some level of investment, but that level of investment was different depending on the condition of the neighborhood and the trajectory of stabilization and growth. We established this quality of life template to allow communities to do deeper and more authentic planning on the ground in their communities under the framework that would allow them and give them the language and tools to focus and prioritize on the issues that were most pressing for them in that moment. It was important for us to establish a process for this work through collective ownership. And specific to that was dismantling the notion that community only meant residents, dismantling the notion that outreach was engagement. It was important to link all sectors of the community together and, and set up a condition of everyone's fingerprints on the planning process. Residents, business, government, nonprofits, institutions, philanthropy, faith-based, and other. In order to make this effort work, it was important that everyone engaging in the process be equipped with tools, language, and knowledge to allow for more effective collaboration and engagement. Transparent access to knowledge became key to establishing the credibility of the process, the credibility of people involved in the process, and the ability to have more informed conversations through the three years of the planning process. Many of us in the planning space discuss economic growth as a regional trend. For Detroit, it was imperative that we talked about economic growth in the city and reinforce the notions that having jobs in the city mattered, particularly because the context of Detroit and the region is so sprawling. And when we began to look at where jobs were, where people lived and issues of mobility, 
making sure we can reconcile all three of those things toward creating prosperous economic growth for households of Detroit residents meant jobs in the city limits was crucial to that. As I said before, it was also important to communicate very early on that every neighborhood had a future. And so we began to establish different neighborhood typologies for which different futures could be possible. And we used these tools um, of narrative cartoons to break down more technical strategies into a storyline that would allow people to see how the redevelopment of an old building could house programs for youth around building skills, but could also build entrepreneurship and businesses where those businesses can ultimately become the owners of assets in their neighborhood. Recognizing that not all vacant land would return to traditional development purposes, either in the near term or the long term, it was important that we began to see land as an asset and look at land at, in support of multifunctional landscapes, moving away from strictly gray infrastructures to open spaces that had multiple functions, including passive and active recreation, stormwater management, cultivation of food, producing of energy, and other means of environmental remediation. And lastly, as I also mentioned before, the process was just as important as the outcomes. Developing multiple strands of tactics that would be deployed over multiple periods of time by multiple stakeholders within the city, not just us as consultants, or clients was imperative to not only raising awareness, but also to building trust and setting the table for informed and engaged and productive conversations where people who participated in those processes would feel an ownership of the plan at the end and would ultimately be active participants in its execution. The final project that I'd like to share with you today um, is the Chodo Greenway in St. Louis. The Chitto Greenway was a design competition uh, that I won with Stoss Landscape Urbanism and other firms to design a five mile urban greenway through the east west corridor of the city, which is known as the Central Corridor, which is the heart of St. Louis's business district and medical and educational institutions. We disrupted the competition brief, which proposed the Greenway North South recognizing that the city was deeply divided spatially north and south with African Americans on the north side of the city and whites and some Latinos on the south side of the city, that it was important that the Greenway connect assets east and west and north and south, crossing this very visible racial divide. The project set a high aspiration for equity but it was up to our team in collaboration with our client group and the community to define what that meant for St. Louis, a city steeped with many of the conditions of injustice discussed earlier in this presentation. Many of you might know that equity in an urban development project is typically positioned in two ways, either as minority participation through contracting and procurement or through community engagement we found that these traditional measures of equity were insufficient. And it was our job to fill the gap to create more meaningful articulations of equity that could be experienced and felt by a broader segment of the population who experienced the greatest injustices in the city. A, mo a more just framework of equitable practices fills in the gap between compliance and engagement. We defined four tracks of equitable and just practice as building business, job, and wealth creation, quality of life in neighborhoods, identity and culture, and civic and community participation. And within each of those frames are a series of tactics and metrics that could be deployed and measure strategies as the Greenway was being built. For example, here, you'll see that a more just framework of equitable practices begins to establish tra transparent definitions and metrics 
around particular and specific tactics that would be needed to support equitable development around the different legs of the Greenway. So for example, under quality of life in neighborhoods, issues of mobility, public safety, affordable housing, anti-displacement, community development and capacity building, as well as community planning are all essential components that would make a more visible and meaningful impact in communities and households that surround the Greenway. And then what was also essential to this process was defining ways that the community broadly, as well as those implementing the Greenway, would be able to present measurable um, indicators of the progress of these practices and the effects that they were having on community. So this work is not perfect. Uh, I am not in any way offering silver bullets towards justice in your city or any city, as each city has a unique set of conditions that are spatial, social, political, and cultural. Looking back at my career, sometimes I've hit the mark and sometimes the outcomes I imagine have not been realized. However, my work is representative of my commitment to rigorous, Lee, directly and without apology, discussing use design as a tool for greater justice. This work and the work that is needed right now requires us to sit uncomfortably in this moment, to absorb the pain, educate ourselves about our history, acknowledge our part in that history, make personal and institutional self-reflections and commitments to change, and then build the allyship needed to truly produce the just city. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Very informative presentation. So much work that you've done. Um, truly uh, wonderful to learn a little bit more about it. Um, in a few moments, we will engage in uh, questions and answers. As you were sharing um, so many tools that, uh, that you sh showed us, um, I have a question from one of our board members who's asking, uh, she's wondering if you have a recommendation for resources that people who want to learn more about implementing just design principles in Rochester, are there any books or movies or websites, organizations, or anything else that you might suggest is a good way of continuing our education on this topic? <laughs> Um, they're a ton, and I think right now, if you were to simply put in designing justice into your Google right now, um, all sorts of resources would come up. Just within the last two weeks, I have stumbled across um, endless amounts of content uh, that is aimed at information. If you're on social media, seek out organizations that you think may be doing this work. Join their Instagram, their Twitter, their Facebook feeds. And I think that that would help you unlock a really robust set of resources. Thank you. Including our website, designforthegistcity.org. Absolutely. I, I was fascinated by your, um, your framework and I, I wanna dive more deeply into it. Uh, we as a community design center uh, strive to be a resource for the community. So certainly, looking at uh, the tools that you've shared and uh, learning about all the different recommendations that you're making and finding ways that we can take uh, the work that's already been done in other cities and, and seeing again what what may apply to our communities and our neighborhoods here is uh, is going to be something that I know I'm going to be exploring uh, with much more interest. Um, I have a, a question from Linda Phillips. This is how can just city principles be implemented in majority white areas to undo the systems that exclude? Um, I think white communities first have to become informed about what is injustice and what is injustice in their community. How did it come to be, right? So that then there can be productive conversations about solutions. And I find, you know, lots of people are very eager to jump to the solution space, but not do the painful work 
of understanding and interrogating and unpacking the history and mm -hmm. understanding it more deeply. Um, because I think only in that understanding and knowledge can real change occur and real collaboration across race, gender, community, sector, discipline um, be meaningful. So I think it's, it's a moment to really stop and learn and reflect first before acting. Um, the index is meant to be a tool to contribute more language to conversations that might be difficult around difficult things we uh, find uncomfortable to talk about like race. Mm -hmm. But perhaps in finding common and shared values that we all want first, as opposed to trying to find an outcome that we can agree upon, um, we are experimenting and testing whether or not people find that to be a more productive way to set up a space for the hard work of dismantling injustice. I know we've had conversations about that in our organization with our board. Um, many resources that are available to uh, learn about the history, learn about in particular the work that we do, how our design world and design of our space intersects with these issues. And um, I, I'm still, I still find that so many people of privilege do not know the history and don't really understand the policies that were very intentionally crafted to, to bring us to where we are. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious about very specifically when you were talking about reparations, how do we start uh, once we start try to educate ourselves and understand this history, if we identify these particular tools that were implemented to segregate people, um, how, what are, are some of those tools that, how can we take those tools and turn them so that they actually work uh, the other way? So how do we undo, how, how do we make reparations for redlining? What would be an appropriate first step or taking those tools that were initially uh, used uh, to separate people and, and try to very intentionally create the tools to bring people together. Yeah, I mean, what's, what's impossible for me to do is provide a sweeping generalized tool to a question like that. I mean, it, it really is impossible. You have to look at the, the, history, the policy, the practices in Rochester, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not only understand what it is, but obviously understand the politics behind it, understand who it's hurting and who it's benefiting, and then try to determine what it is you want as an alternative to that. I think that work is going to be incredibly difficult because there are lots of institutions and structures that are vested in the way things are right now. And so it is going to require quite a lot of not only community will, but political will to dismantle some of these things that exist within policy frameworks, that exist within legislation frameworks, not just practices and attitudes. And this is what the difference between racism and structural racism means. This is not about someone's behavior or attitudes. This is about the way in which certain practices lend themselves for some of that behavior or thought or belief to be executed. And so how do you, you know, audit your own organizations for its practices? How do you look at yourselves first and what you're doing or not doing. Examine the ways that you may be on various sort of um, spectrums of the racist to anti-racist spectrum, right, as an organization. And then begin to look at your laws, your practices, your policies, and, you know, slowly begin to erode and reverse them and find the specific, you know, tools to your question that you think dismantle, whether it's around public investing, whether it's around housing, whether it's around transportation, whether it's around access to food. I mean, you know, it has to be born out of what you all believe are some of your most urgent um, uh, challenges and issues 
and around, you know, who are the constituents who experienced the greatest injustice for which you want to prioritize working on behalf of. Thank you, Tony. We have a question. What are your thoughts about green infrastructure upgrades to help climate change and enhance city neighborhoods? Well, as you saw in the example that I briefly showed from Detroit Future City, it was critical to us that we change the paradigm of land, vacant land being a liability to vacant land being an asset. And because I imagine Rochester also has its share of vacancy and depopulation, not on the scale of Detroit in any way, but has land assets that are not going to be, you know, new housing anytime soon, right? How can those be deployed through landscape tactics that are multifunctional? So how might you transform some of those spaces, not just thinking about the street and right of public right of way, but adjacent vacant land is contributing to the way in which you manage stormwater, contributing to the ways with which you address um, heat island effect by green planting, contributing to the way you think about the types of plantings that you use that are actually helping to clean the soil over time. Um, thinking about shade trees, thinking about ground cover, thinking about soft green systems for absorbing water. I think all of these um, are strategies that many legacy cities, those cities that have a large population loss and a lot of vacant land are beginning to experiment with. So uh, there's a whole section in Detroit Future City, which is available online, that talks about a series of tactics that are both blue and green infrastructure uh, that we were strongly encouraging be deployed. Great, thank you. Uh, along the same lines, I have a question. Uh, planting more trees, build gardens, and stormwater management to create urban architecture, agriculture sites could be some options for transforming these areas. Brownfields converted to solar power generation sites to power LMI communities should be, could be implemented with future grants. Should these options be given priority? Depends on where you are. <laughs> Um, and, and priority over what? Um, right. In Detroit Future City, through part of the framework plan, we did a very um, sweeping assessment of land conditions, not only looking at where vacancy was, where population was, but also looking at the composition of the population, um, both racial composition, income population, home ownership population, commercial corridors. Um, we looked at a series of both demographic and spatial indicators to come up with a typology of different types of neighborhoods. So they range from the very high vacancy to moderate vacancy to low vacancy. And from that, we designed a series of different types of neighborhood typologies that range from um, high urban density uh, to low rise density to productive um, green neighborhoods. And within that structure, we were able to assign or I guess recommend certain priorities for where you would do those tactics more robustly, uh, where you would deploy them uh, more generously or where you would deploy them more minimally. And so I do think, and this is why taking that time to do the citywide framework was so important, because it then becomes a decision-making tool, helps to become a decision-making tool for how to prioritize investments like that and where to deploy them. Also in the framework plan um, is a specific section about public land and a series of decision matrices that allow public officials and community leaders to given certain conditions make a series of decisions that allow them to do effective decision making and uh, transparent prioritizing around questions like that. So in, in the plan there are a series of tools that kind of answer what we came up with as mechanisms for making those types of priorities and decisions. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Miriam Zinter. When studying cities that have high levels of racial disparity and abandonment, is there some characteristic that is always present? 
physical delineations between the haves and have nots, removal of capital, removal of jobs, what are the common denominators? All of those things and policies that intentionally segregated those cities 70 years ago. Those are the common denominators. Redlining, urban renewal, um, block busting, um, um, uh, legacies of Jim Crow laws, all of those things are underlying conditions that then set up the series of disparities that we witness today in cities. Wayne Childs asks, what are some of the most common zoning practices still in place that have historically, historically led to injustices within our city? Um, policies that um, are silent or soft on the distribution of affordable housing is one. So it's not a policy that's there, it's actually a policy that isn't there. So if, if you don't have inclusionary zoning in your zoning regulation now, that is in fact one thing that may be contributing to the deepening or the um, ineffectiveness of that production uh, in your city. Um, in some cases um, where we find um, the overabundance of zoning for um, single family homes versus multifamily um, is another example of, of perhaps where that occurs. Those are two off the top of my head. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a summer intern, Emily Eversall, who asks, how can we hold our academic institutions accountable for dismantling racism and injustice embedded in our pedagogies, curriculums, and instruction? Well, I will just talk about the two schools that I've um, been associated with, um, University of Notre Dame, um, which I'm a graduate of, and Harvard, which I'm currently on the faculty of. Both, uh, both um, student um, organizations, uh, Notre Dame and uh, the GSD, have issued very strong um, statements um, with very clear and articulate recommendations for addressing that issue. And I'm, I'm understanding that a number of schools of architecture in particular are doing the same thing. So I go find those out in the world. And they are asking for everything from um, the way in which multiculturalism and, and, and in particular issues of um, blacks and black architecture are embedded in core curriculums across the board. The composition of staff, faculty, and students. Uh, the necessity for a cultural competency training at the staff, faculty, and student level. Mm -hmm. The simple acknowledgement of non-Eurocentric contributions to architecture. The inclusion of people of color on lectures, on juries, on pen-ups and reviews, as speakers in class. The activation of alumni, of people of color, are just a handful of things um, that students are talking about. And we certainly, I'll just speak for the GSD, are talking very specifically about as a faculty. My own department, uh, the Department of Urban Planning and Design, for example, has done a full audit of all of our core classes and electives um, as a scan of looking for discussions of both social justice and climate change across this curriculum and are beginning to make shifts specifically in our core curriculum to ensure that those issues addressed are across the board. Thank you. Glenn Cercelletti asks, um, he is a committee member on the uh, lecture planning committee. He says, thank you for sharing your thoughtful and transformative work. Could you please share more about how you think about work, your work in relation to the criminal justice system and law enforcement, which are in our focus now as systems that continue to maintain and enforce social injustice? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I have not had opportunities to work specifically in that space. Um, and it is deeply complicated. I don't, I don't know that I, I will have a fully baked answer to that. A, a, a friend and colleague of mine, Deanna Van Buren, 
um, has, has built her practice on specifically working within the criminal justice system and institutions of incarceration and is building a really interesting body of work that is dismantling the notion of incarceration and prison. Um, there have also been efforts more broadly uh, by certain factions of the AIA or the encouragement um, for the AIA to sign on to um, um, architects not no longer designing um, spaces of incarceration. I think that system broadly um, requires deep reform, just as we're talking about reforms within um, policing structures. So, and so I think in talking about the underlying sort of policy of incarceration and policing, when that yields reform solutions that then suggest how space for dealing with criminal justice should be transformed, feels more like the trajectory and the starting point of the conversation as opposed to leading with the, the sort of spatial implication of that. Um, because I, I think the underlying laws, just like we were talking about zoning and protocols and procedures embedded in that are at the root of the problems uh, and the um, pain we as African Americans are experiencing um, through the hands of law and incarceration. Um, so I think the conversation should start there. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that thoughtful answer. Um, we have a question from Katie Guyton. It says, where substantial updates have been made to zoning codes to encourage a better urban fabric. Can you offer suggestions on realistic ways to address existing to remain sometimes dated and dilapidated structures within that updated fabric? Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure that that's a, uh, a matter of zoning so much as it is a matter of um, investment and redevelopment policy that mm -hmm. any particular city has and how they value historic preservation. Uh, it's very steeped in uh, capitalism <laughs> and uh, 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 public policy around redevelopment, which again is different from city uh, to city. Um, it's also very steeped in the resources um, that drive redevelopment and reinvestment uh, in cities. Um, I think it's particularly hard for cities like Rochester and Detroit and other cities that are so grappling with population loss or stagnation and large amounts of vacant land because the market for redevelopment, whether it's new construction or the preservation of existing buildings, is quite difficult financially given the sources of capital required for, for reinvestment. I think this is when planning is really important. Um, and these are great moments for planning when we're, we're in the throes of recession before big waves of growth occur, because here is where um, public policy can lead in shaping the vision for what it is you want to see. And so there are areas of your city for which that is important. That's gotta be embedded in the pu public policy documentation, which means plans need to be approved and ratified by your public bodies, uh, not just plans that you do off on the side, but they need a kind of legal tooth to them. So whether they get appended to your comprehensive plan or approved as small area plans or whatever you call them within your zoning code, those are the things uh, that help push forward an agenda and signal to the private sector the intentions of a community. Those are always subject to change as your political leadership changes, but within the moment of time that you're in, um, at least it, it is a record of the public sentiment uh, around the direction uh, that they see for reinvestment in their city. Thank you. Howard, your friend Howard asks, Tony, how successful have local economic development organizations, locally funded, been in working with residents in disinvested places in our cities? Mixed. <laughs> sometimes they haven't produced measurable change at all, um, and sometimes they have. I have found in my 
short time in my practice and working with different cities that where I have seen at least the intentionality to grapple with these ch challenges, to prioritize the least not included, um, is when that work is done not by a single sector. So where I've seen either progress be slow or progress not be as effective is when it's only the city's plan or the mayor's plan or the public redevelopment agency's plan or the community's plan or the business sector's plan. I've seen it be more effective when some combination of those sectors can come together and create a, a, a shared agenda and a collaborative client group that through the process of planning and establishing policy, they are doing that hand in hand. Because as you know, any type of redevelopment or, or tools that are unpacking injustice or um, moving the growth of the city of along is going to require government, is going to require the business sector, is going to require philanthropy, is going to re require the nonprofits um, to do this work together. So, so my approach in, in my work, particularly over the last 10 years, in working in cities has been to help the initial person who reaches out to me uh, for a plan to establish a cross-sectoral client group in doing that work very early on so that all of those sectors are implicated in not only the creation of the plan but in the execution of the plan and there is where i've seen a bit more measurable progress on the dismantling of some of the issues that we're talking about Um, hopefully this is a fun question for you. My friend Rohan Parikh asks, could you share a few examples of recent projects that you have been excited about that help us move towards more just cities and places, either in process or in outcome? Um, I'm currently working uh, in Chicago um, for a new nonprofit called the, Economic, the Emerald South Economic Development Collaborative, which represents represents the neighborhoods that surround um, the Obama Presidential Center. Um, and that is a really exciting project for me, not only because it's my hometown, uh, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, but because it's a moment to actually think very specifically and intentionally about what it means to bring about economic growth, prosperity, wealth building, for a community that looks like me with an organization run by people uh, that look like me and begin to um, center the valuing of black assets, whether they be people-based or place-based um, in a way that we don't typically see. These are spaces that, again, have been intentionally devalued when we were doing work in St. Louis, you know, we found that the, on the north side of the city, predominantly African-American has seen the, the lion's share of vacancy um, and abandonment. The ability for a homeowner to get a valuation or appraisal of their property in the same way that they get it in other parts of the city is unheard of. And there is a system at play that is devaluing those land assets um, even though on paper they look identical. So the ability to sort of bring about a, a valuation of spaces and places and programs that have historically been devalued, I'm extremely excited about uh, modeling a way forward for communities that look like uh, the Emerald South neighborhoods. Thank you. Roger Brown, our founding father, asks, how can beauty in the public realm contribute to just design? Um, a lot of ways. Um, I think um, we actually did a study with Gail um, Architects in 2015, which is also on the website, um, called Public Life and Urban Justice for Public Spaces. And this was an attempt to create a framework of indicators and metrics that could demonstrate whether or not public space contributed to not only good public life, which is at the core of Jan Gell's work, 
but also a sense of social justice. And so we developed a fairly elaborate framework of about 74 different metrics that allowed us or allowed the city or allowed communities to determine whether or not um, indicators of beauty, equity, inclusion, access, connectivity were present. So in the space of beauty, a couple of things that we were looking at there was one, um, and we, we use secondary research, but we also use survey tools. And one, a couple of things that we asked were um, how um, the improvement of the public space um, either made them feel safe, um, did they find that they used the space more because it was beautiful, um, what made it beautiful to them. And so we did find that the improvement, the physical improvement of something of a space that someone deems beautiful uh, 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 made a measurable impact on their utilization of their space, their sense of feeling safe, uh, the potential for more social connectivity uh, than they otherwise would have in public space. And we segmented that information so we were actually able to assess that feeling by age, by income, by race, and by gender. Surprisingly, uh, the way in which the number ratcheted up for women's safety was quite high. Um, we found that people of lower incomes, it had a, a, a broader impact uh, than people of higher incomes. So again, it's a really interesting study. Beauty was actually one of the indicators that we used to look at justice and public life. And again, uh, the findings of all of that can be found on our website. And it's a report that um, you can easily download. Thank you. Catherine Says asks, for cities like Los Angeles that have decades old issue of homelessness and that unfortunately affect populations of color more so than others, how do you believe recent renewed conversations about racial injustice can help solve this problem? Um, you know, some of these questions, some of these issues are just a question of our basic humanity um, and how we care for one another, um, even though um, people who are experiencing some of those deeper challenges happen to be people of color. Um, and it's a part of our longer conversation about um, who deserves housing and access to housing. Um, and so I don't have a silver bullet kind of response to what the specific intervention should be. Um, it's interesting that uh, in the space of COVID, um, this was certainly happening on our campus, but I know that a lot of work even happened here in New York uh, as a way of um, protecting us all um, from the health crisis. We somehow found places to put people. <laughs> and take care of people uh, as a protective measure uh, during the spread of the virus. I think that hopefully there are lessons we can learn from the things we did in the space of crisis that can become more longer term and institutional strategies for caring for people in need, like the use of, space, use of buildings that aren't being used or that are vacant and abandoned as spaces for this ways with which the ecosystem of health and care and food and shelter um, become a more integrated wicked problem to solve for as opposed to the sort of segmented way in which we solve problems particularly for people of need so it'd be interesting for somebody to kind of assess what we did in crisis and figure out if there are ways to institutionalize some of that innovation that we were forced to create during this time. I agree. I have a question that asks, in your opinion, is there any way to combat corporate land ownership, luxury buildings that ends up gentrifying communities through design? So is there <laughs> any way to combat that type of investment? The, the, the wholesale reform of capitalism. Um, one of the things, <laughs> One of the things that I talk about uh, in a course that I teach called the gentrification debate, so one of the things we discussed as a class, I should say, is trying to understand what makes communities and neighborhoods vulnerable to the negative impacts of gentrification, 
right? Because there are both negative and positive impacts of gentrification. Central to what makes people and spaces vulnerable is the lack of ownership. So how we begin to talk about, think about, put forward strategies ahead of the curve of growth into a particular area of the city, deepening home ownership, deepening business ownership, deepening community capacity to engage, have got to be things that we do early on in the establishment of neighborhood stabilization in order to help withstand the potential negative impacts of gentrification. And then going back to an earlier question in terms of the policy frameworks that have to be established that put forward the visions for what people or policymakers want neighborhoods or areas of the city to become and making those plans policy documents. So those are two things that I have found that have to kind of run simultaneously and ahead of the curve of growth in order to lessen the potential negative impacts of gentrification that are often um, seen as displacement, which can be either voluntary or involuntary. And it's very hard to track and determine which one is at play. Kim Russell asks, in our region, there are great racial and economic disparities between those who live in our city and those who live in our suburbs. Can you provide any examples where cities and counties have cooperated to build more just communities? <laughs> if not, any guidance on how we can do that here? Um, I won't give you specific examples, but I'll give you um, a great book. It's called Just Growth. Um, it was written by um, USC professors Manuel Pastor and Chris Bender. Um, they look at six regions that have actually deployed an agenda around what they call just regional growth. Um, I know Indianapolis is one, Jacksonville is another, um, I won't remember all six, but I have found that to be a really interesting examination of the types of practices, regional practices, that were used. Another really interesting part of that work that I remember is they make a distinction between locales that have gone through um, really specific and deep um, civil unrest around race and those that have not. And that there is a difference in the effectiveness of moving towards regional cooperation and regional agendas in regions that have that history and regions that don't. So I'll leave it as a cliffhanger as to which one is which, um, but it's a really, um, I, I found that a really great resource and the work that Chris and Manuel do in that space um, has been really helpful to me in my work. Great, well we have time for just a few more questions as the program is scheduled to end at 1.30, but uh, I just wanted to let you know we're, we're getting there, Tony. Um, no I have a question from Lane Rafaldini Ruben, who asks, how can we adapt strategies of disruptive practice to the relationships that architects and so-called conventional practices have with their clients? How can we navigate this painful work in a way that doesn't scare off private clients back into their conventional decision-making processes? Yeah. Um you know, I, I guess I can only answer that through my own journey, um, which I guess one requires a bit of bravery. Um, I, I twice quit a job without a job. <laughs> um, in one of those times I began teaching, which was obviously uh, helpful to me financially, but something I, I wanted to do. And have to say, as a practitioner, I have found as a really useful space for me to interrogate and reflect and really just be energized um, by students and being in the academy. And it's kept me hopeful. Young people absolutely keep me hopeful. Um, so it requires a bit of personal risk taking, I think, on the work we do. When I was a young architect at Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, I often found myself volunteering um, I did some work um, with the Chicago Urban League. I was on a young metropolitan board. 
Um, so I found spaces outside of my firm uh, that allowed me to um, get my hands dirty on issues that I, that I cared about, as well as uh, many of our professional um, organizations, AIA, APA, ASLA, NOMA, um, are creating committee spaces for this type of work. So that's another outlet for engaging. Um, and I think, you know, we each then um, have to continue to put these issues on the table without fear. Um, if we don't talk about them, if you don't put them on the table, because by the way, I am still oftentimes the only woman and the only person of color in a room and I am not going to bear the burden of putting that issue on the table all the time and every time. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. I shouldn't have to do it. I can't be the only one that does it. So we need people who don't look like me to step into this space and take the risks to do it and form conversations. And by the way, that's not just in your professional spaces. That's in your personal spaces, too. Right? Agreed. The self reflection that we need. You know, there are multiple places to, to get comfortable with these conversations. And I just encourage everyone to utilize as many of them as they can. That is not just the, the professional space um, to do that. Because we need everyone, as we're seeing young people, and they think, you know, I was asking my dad what he thought was different between now and 68. And many people of his generation are saying this, which is the composition of who is in the streets and marching. Uh, in unison is quite different uh, than it was um, then. And we have to all lean into that in our own individual, with our own individual convictions, um, as well as our institutional and organizational convictions. I agree, Tony, thank you. I have two more questions from students and it'll be a good way to end our, our presentation today. One is from Stefan Kaufmarker. Equity and justice-centered design is becoming more common, but still doesn't tend to drive design. I'm curious what other ways you might have found for firms like yours going beyond leading by example. Um, you chopped up just a little bit, uh, Maria. Can you just read the last part of the, quest or the question part again? Yes, I'm curious what other ways you might have found for firms like yours going beyond leading by example. Um, to, for design to have an impact on injustice, what else can I, what else can I do? Yeah, let's see. Do you have any advice for architecture, urban planning students? Or, okay, this is another question. Excuse me. Um, no. so yeah, people are skeptical. And so is there anything more that you can do besides leading from example? No, no, not personally. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, personally, no, I mean, no. I mean, I think leading by the example has been effective for me. But you know, I'm old. I've been doing this for <laughs> I've been doing this for a little while. So I'm fortunate enough to have a body of work that begins to be representative of um, well, begins to articulate. I think the work that needs to be done, and then is starting to be representative of I think um, that aspiration. Um, but, you know, we have to get involved and engage with those um, that are doing it if you're not, you know, doing it yourself through your own practice or if the practice you're in isn't doing it. So I think it's about finding the spaces where you can begin to explore and express and create with others uh, that believe this agenda is important, whether that's racial injustice, whether that's climate change, whether that's whatever injustice you feel um, is resonating with you that needs bodies uh, uh, to engage. Um, writing was important for me. Um, you know, I wasn't finding my voice during COVID. You know, I was a bit numb to just the mounting, you know, death uh, that was you know, projected in front of us every day um, and didn't have a clear point of view about um, what I thought I could contribute to that. Um, it wasn't towards the end of that, and this is why I started with the story of my cousin and she sent that text uh, to me that something kind of shifted for me. Uh, and it was only then that I kind of, if you follow me on Instagram, I started transitioning from 
social distancing meals to <laughs> a point of view about the kind of injustice that was kind of becoming more visible and the reactions to that injustice. So, you know, I use my social media sometimes as just an outlet to vent and express, um, of which everyone can too. Who I follow, you know, is a, is a measure of that. Um, so again, it, it's really about how you kind of figure out your own um, point of view um, and knowledge and experience of this. And then I, I feel like you then begin to feel your way to where it makes sense to be for you um, and where you feel like you can authentically um, have an impact. Thank you so much, Tony. Those are great, great words of wisdom and advice. I think that's a great note to end on. I apologize for those of you whose questions we did not get to. We will try to um, respond to them in-house, uh, but we had many, many questions. So uh, thank you so much for participating. And so with that, I'd like to take this moment to thank Tony for uh, being able to participate in this presentation with us. Um, we have uh, speaker gifts that were provided by the Susan B. Anthony House. We want you to walk away with a purse of your own. Uh, the wonderful um, Susan B. Anthony replica uh, purse created by uh, a local designer, Abigail Riggs and a variety of other gifts from local businesses. So we will pack this up and send it on to you, Tony, but just a small oh token it. of our appreciation for your time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. And uh, so we ask you to continue the conversation with us. Uh, we will have a follow-up Zoom um, webinar or, or meeting next week to take the things that we were uh, that were presented today, uh, some of the conversation we had, and continue that connected to our local context. Keep working together as a community to use these tools that were shared with us uh, as a way that we can be more impactful. So, please uh, join us next week for that follow-up conversation. And then, as like many other uh, organizations, our programming was disrupted, and uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to reschedule our March and April lectures. So we look forward to our presentation with Bernie's Rattle on, in September. So please save the date and we'll look forward to continuing uh, this wonderful lecture series that celebrates women in design through the entire year. So thank you. We're looking forward to that. And uh, lastly, please do not forget about your survey. We uh, would really appreciate your feedback and it helps us to improve our programming. So I appreciate all of your time today, the excellent questions, and uh, let's keep working together to make our community better. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Kimberly. And thank you, Monica. Thank you very much, Maria, and all those who helped pull this off. Much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.